My name is Gary Blau. I am honored to serve as SAMHSA's Senior Advisor for Children, Youth, and Families. And I want to welcome you to today's session as part of National Children's Mental Health Awareness Week. Many of you know that uh, SAMHSA created a, a day, uh, the Awareness Day, almost 15 years ago, actually, to shine a spotlight on the importance of what we like to say is for caring for every child's mental health and to reinforce the message that positive mental health is essential to a child's healthy development. Um, and I'm really happy to say that after a several year hiatus, that it's really nice to be back. Um, today, as part of our agenda and our event, you'll first hear from Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, our Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use. And she's gonna highlight some key data points around our behavioral health crisis, uh, talk about the president's unity agenda uh, aimed at transforming our health and social service infrastructure and share SAMHSA's uh, approach to addressing uh, youth mental, emotional and behavioral health challenges across the country. Uh, also, want, um, we wanting to highlight the importance of youth and families in our work. And so we're excited that Johanna Bergen from Youth Move and Hugh Davis from Wisconsin Family Ties, uh, as well as our leaders from the Center for, Center for Mental Health Services, Dr. Anita Everett and uh, Dr. Melinda Baldwin will be joining us. So we have a lot to do. And so we're just going to get started here. And let me say that uh, I am extremely uh, pleased and proud to introduce our Assistant Secretary, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. Um, she has, uh, she took over the role as Assistant Secretary and is, runs the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, prior to that, she served for six years as Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, uh, along with several other roles. Um, uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman uh, was also an Adjunct Associate Professor at Yale um, for over 20 years and uh, worked at SAMHSA as a Senior policy advisor for, uh, as a White House appointment um, as a senior advisor to the administrator. So now that she's returned, we are so grateful to have her back, to have her leadership. And Dr. Delphin Rittman, I am uh, proud to turn this session over to you. Thank you so much, Gary. And, and welcome, everyone. Welcome. Um, we are so excited about our session today and so glad that you can join us. Uh, we're pleased to be commemorating uh, Children's Mental Health Awareness Day with you all. And you know, we could not think of a better topic to highlight than uh, youth and uh, family peer support. Uh, so we're excited about our topic for today. Um, I also wanna say a special thank you to Johanna Bergen and also Hugh Davis who are with us and they'll be bringing a youth and family voice to this event. So I welcome them. Uh, and we know that it's so important that you know, today and every day that we continue our, our focus on caring for every child's mental health. And so that is what we'll be talking about today. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So youth mental health is, is so important. It actually is identified as one of SAMHSA's five priority areas. Uh, and so this is an area where we focus quite a bit of, uh, of time and attention and resources. And you will see some of that coming up in some of the upcoming slides. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to transition and talk a little bit about some of the prevalence rates for youth mental health and, and what some of the current data is showing us. Uh, next slide, please. One thing we know is that even before the pandemic, uh, young people were experiencing mental health challenges. Um, so for example, 20% of young people had a mental, emotional, or behavioral health disorder at any given time. Uh, and about 10% uh, have a serious emotional disturbance. Um, and what I mean by that when I say serious emotional disturbance is it means that their mental health condition uh, impacts their ability to function at home, uh, in school, or in the community. Uh, so certainly we know that young people are, have struggled. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when we take into consideration COVID-19, uh, what we see is that COVID-19 has created significant challenges as well and exacerbated some of the challenges that we've already seen uh, with children and youth. Um, so for example, depression and anxiety doubled in youth compared to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and, and so tragically, um, we now have over 200,000 uh, US children that have experienced the death of a primary or secondary caregiver. Uh, and we know here, the data shows us that uh, children of color are disproportionately impacted. 
Um, in addition to that, CDC recently released data uh, from their Adolescent Behaviors and Experiences Survey uh, that indicated about one in three high school students uh, experienced poor mental health during the pandemic. Um, and, nearly, and nearly half of students actually reported uh, persistently feeling sad or helpless. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the president in his State of the Union address highlighted uh, the importance of addressing mental health and noted the mental health crisis that we're experiencing, uh, pledged to meet this challenge head on. Uh, and so that's some of what I'll discuss in the next set of slides. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the president's unity agenda, it, it, it lays out a vision uh, for transforming mental health. Uh, and how mental health is understood, how it's perceived, uh, how it's treated, and how it's integrated. Uh, the strategy has three pillars, three primary pillars. Um, these include strengthening system capacity, um, in part by building a national certification program for peer specialists. Um, this program will accelerate uh, universal adoption, recognition, and integration of the peer mental health work for us, workforce across all segments of the healthcare system. Um, we're looking forward to developing this collaboratively uh, in partnership with individuals in recovery. And, and so uh, that will be an important area of work moving forward. Um, in addition, increasing connections to care um, by, for example, things like uh, increasing access to school linked mental health supports um, or by embedding or co-locating uh, behavioral health providers within community settings. And we know community-based mental health care is so important. Um, also creating healthy environments that foster a culture and environment that broadly promotes mental, uh, mental wellness and recovery. Um, so those are, those are the three pillars of the uh, president's mental health agenda. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, I'm so excited that the president's FY23 budget uh, actually includes about $3.7 billion uh, to address the nation's mental health crisis. Um, this slide, there's a lot on this slide, but what it shows really, if you look at the far right column, um, that there are a number of programs that have received really significant increases in resources. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a few on the next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, so for example, the president's FY23 budget uh, Project AWARE has received and uh, is proposed to receive a $123 million increase. Uh, in addition, the, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, $68 million increase. And you'll see the other increases in terms of uh, some of the children and youth focused programs and initiatives. Um, so we're excited about this budget. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is a framework that SAMHSA has developed around um, implementing the president's vision. Uh, and we call this framework the HOPE framework. Uh, HOPE framework for children, youth, and family behavioral health. And I'll, I'll share more about what, what I mean by that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so HOPE stands for health, opportunity, potential, and equity. Uh, so again, health, opportunity, potential, and equity. Um, and our aim is to bring hope to children and families across the country by creating expanded uh, programs and initiatives so that all children, youth, and families uh, can thrive in their homes and their communities. Um, we've created a vision statement, and that statement is that all children, youth, young adults, uh, and their families thrive in their homes and communities and experience health, uh, opportunities for success, uh, and the ability to reach their full potential through equitable strategies that build strengths. Next slide, please. Um, so what I'm gonna do now on this slide is just go through the framework, framework uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, the framework itself has three tiers of support. Uh, these are tiers uh, H, O, and P, and you'll see those uh, along the side of the triangle there. Um, and then across all tiers is the E for equity. Uh, and then at the foundation is workforce, because we know workforce is so critical uh, for implementing all of, the, all of the work that we're talking about. Actually, my light just went off. Um, so tier H is about providing uh, health for all. Uh, for example, tier H reflects services and supports that focus on, again, providing health for every young person in America. Um, we know that you can't have health without mental, emotional, and behavioral health. 
Um, and this essentially is it's consistent with the universal approach uh, that focuses on promoting wellness uh, and preventing the onset of mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, tier O is about creating opportunity for at-risk youth. Um, essentially, it, cre it, it is about creating opportunities for youth who are at risk to experience early, di early identification and early intervention programs and strategies. Uh, and then tier P uh, is about the potential for youth with uh, SEM, so uh, social emotional disturbance or SMI or SUD. Uh, it's essentially about promoting uh, evidence-based uh, effective interventions uh, to treat uh, and ultimately uh, connect you to services and supports that will help them reach their full potential. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned before, across all tiers is uh, E, equity. And we know that equity is so critical uh, essentially to ensure that we deliver all of our services and supports uh, in a way that's culturally and linguistically appropriate. Um, and if we do this, this ultimately can help to reduce disparities and, and promote equity. Um, and then of course, workforce is the foundation of the, of the framework because we know underlying all of this work, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is uh, a workforce who is poised and trained to deliver evidence-based interventions uh, and measure, measurement-based care. Uh, next slide, please. So we're excited about this framework. We are already working to identify programs and initiatives that fit into the various tiers of services and supports. Um, this slide here illustrates that essentially what we'll do is we'll focus on health for all, um, opportunities for those who are at risk or in need of early identification and early intervention. Um, and then at the top, specialized treatment services for those with serious emotional disturbance uh, or serious mental illness or substance use disorders. Next slide, please. Um, so again, the whole framework, it, it focuses on a number of different themes. I mean, one theme certainly is around uh, building capacity uh, and training to enhance and expand the child and behavioral health workforce. Um, we know there it'll be critical to develop a workforce uh, that is expanded, that is comprised of peers, of parents, of paraprofessionals, of allied professionals, uh, and of clinicians. Um, we know that we also uh, need to focus on uh, integrated care. Um, and that's so important because we know oftentimes uh, individuals will bring their children to, uh, to primary care settings. And so therefore it's critical that we embed uh, mental health and behavioral health interventions in primary care settings. Um, another theme is that it's critical that we confront the role of technology and social media. Um, we know that technology can offer a range of online supports and social connection. Um, but at the same time, we've seen that social media can also uh, contribute to increased harm and, and, uh, and potential risk. And so that's an important area to pay attention um, and an area that we'll be doing work in moving forward as well. Um, and then of course, it's, it's important that um, services and supports are crisis focused and that uh, individuals and families are able to be connected to crisis services and supports um, when needed uh, so that families will have someone to call uh, someone to respond and a safe place to be uh, and go if, if stabilization is needed. And so that's an important part of the framework as well. Um, so again, we're excited about this framework. We know that uh, it's an opportunity to continue to address uh, children and youth emotional um, wellness and behavioral health. Uh, it is wellness focused, it's early intervention focused, uh, school-based and school linkage, linkages to care is critical. Um, and these are all critical parts of the, of the framework. Um, so I'll stop there. And again, just wanna welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for the, our event today. Uh, and thank you for the work that you do every day to promote the, the health and wellness of children and youth across the country. Uh, so thank you. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to Gary now. Great, thank you so much. Um, and <clears throat> we, we really appreciate your comments and, and your leadership during this really critical time. Um, I think people are having trouble. I guess there's not the every one button is not available on the, on the chat. Uh, so please keep sending us uh, to the hosts and panelists and we'll compile those for, uh, you know, to either respond or to try to get back to people. And yes, we are planning to uh, provide the slides and the recording um, at a, at a 
time in the very near future. So thank you so much. Uh, I do think it's a wonderful time for SAMHSA to be offering hope uh, to the nation's young people and families and to do so in a way that makes strategic sense is, is really a, an exciting opportunity. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anita Everett. Dr. Everett is the director of the Center for Mental Health Services. Um, and in this role, she provides executive leadership for federal efforts to improve the nation's mental health service system. Um, Anita is well known in uh, the country. She's been on a number of boards, been the past president of the Maryland Psychiatric Society, the American Association of Community Psychiatrists. Um, she's also done international work and she's a real champion for uh, issues related to mental health in general and for youth uh, children, youth, uh, young adults, and their families. So, um, Anita, we look forward to your remarks. Turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blau. Uh, I'm really proud to be a part of this event uh, to this afternoon. Um, you know, SAMHSA has had longstanding support of uh, youth and youth, and uh, and we're, I know today, part of the focus for today is on peer supports and peer support specialists and the role that there, and SAMHSA has really, you know, played a national leadership role with regards to fostering that and um, very proud to be part of that and carry that work forward in my current role at CMHS. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Dr. Delphin Rittman uh, outlined really beautifully well many of the uh, activities and events that SAMHSA has uh, had the privilege of engaging with around children um, in an effort to, um, to prioritize the role and the, the, the um, level of attention to children within SAMHSA. One of the, the things that we've done is to create a, a whole division that's dedicated primarily to services and, and our initiatives and activities and grants uh, that are centered on children. So rather than having a branch that focuses on it, which in the federal government context is a, is a smaller component, we consolidated um, many of the programs that are focused around children. And I'm very proud to announce to this group uh, that we've created a division uh, uh, which is a which is a, a broader uh, focus, and it's it's a, a whole a full third of all the activities that we engage in within my center, the Center for Mental Health Services. That division is led by Dr. Melinda Baldwin. Many of you I, I know are aware of, or I have met, had the privilege of meeting Melinda, uh, and she'll if you haven't, you're she'll be speaking a, a little bit later. So, really, that's my main message. I want the, the, the community of uh, individuals who are concerned about the social and emotional development of our children to know that we're behind you at SAMHSA and here, here and ready to do our role uh, to, to help with ser providing uh, service to America's children so that all of our children have a chance to develop uh, and grow in healthy uh, social and emotionally healthy adults so they can assume roles as leadership, as effective leaders um, at, in, our, in, in America. Our children are the future of all of us. So thank you. Uh, Gary, uh, I'll turn back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Everett, um, and appreciate not only your leadership, but um, I, I do need to say that, you know, having been at SAMHSA for many, many years and uh, really wished that we could have consolidated our children's services, uh, the fact that you did that with uh, Dr. Baldwin and the leadership at SAMHSA, I think is tremendous. It's, it bodes well um, because it really does look at the entire continuum of services and supports an array that goes from wellness and prevention of services all the way through uh, treatment and recovery type supports. And, um, and so I think that it, it really is a structural piece uh, at SAMHSA that was a long time in coming. And uh, I applaud those efforts, congratulate you and, and appreciate all of that. So again, thank you so much. Um, it is now uh, my pleasure. Uh, I do think that the chat box is working now. So folks, please uh, uh, you know, continue to send us messages. We appreciate that. Um, and now I get the distinct honor to turn to some national experts that uh, really do embody the values and principles that we have not only at SAMHSA, we also have them across the country when we come to think of issues related to you know, child, youth, young adult, uh, um, behavioral health issues. Uh, the first person I'm going to introduce is Johanna Bergen. Johanna is currently the executive director of Youth Move National. And for those of you who don't know, Youth Move stands for Youth Motivating Others Through Voices of Experience. 
And Johanna leads and guides Youth Move's national work that to support and ensure that all young adults in youth serving system are seen as leaders and are engaged in this process. As a young mother, Johanna saw the need for positive systems change and was one of the many young adults on the front lines of Youth Move's national uh, founding um, and really helped to put Youth Move on the map. Um, and in her role, she's also seen to it that Youth Move now not only has over 60 chapters across the country, it also is providing technical assistance related to youth engagement and youth involvement in systems. Uh, all over America. She strongly believes that change stems from dialogue between individuals with lived experience. Um, and on her, on her bio, on her website, you, it says that you wouldn't believe about this about Johanna, but she's an introvert. Um, uh, so I was interested in that. Uh, certainly would not, not from my perspective. However, Johanna, you've done an amazing job. You've brought Youth Move to a new level. We so thank and appreciate you. And I'm turning over uh, this to uh, Johanna Bergen. Go ahead, Johanna. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bob, for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. Glad to be with you all today and particularly honored that we return to celebrating Children's Mental Health Awareness Day at the national level with a focus on youth and parent peer support. Um, something uh, I, I often tell my team and the youth advocates that I work with that it's not very often in our careers that we'll be able to be a part of creating something completely brand new uh, within the mental health system. And I think that our contributions to bringing youth peer support to young people across the country is just that. Um, so honored to be with you all. I'm excited to share a little bit about the, our perspective on the importance of youth peer support and what we can all do um, as fellow change agents to increase uh, access to youth peer support by youth and young adults um, from all across the country. Uh, so Gary, Gary took my opening, um, MOVE is an acronym, motivating others through voices of experience. And that is what we strive to do each and every day um, and within our national team and across the chapter network. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, Youth Move was founded by a group of young adults who were brought together because of their shared experiences in the youth mental health system and their desire to create change. Uh, from the beginning, uh, these, this group of young people gave us um, two distinct charges that we carry um, out each day. One was to unite the voices of young people um, so that we could increase our power to be more effective advocates. Uh, the work of the Youth Move Chapter Network um, is primarily how we do this. Um, to know that each young person serving on an advisory council as a youth trainer, as a youth consultant, as a youth peer provider is not alone, but rather is connected through a network of, of advocates is so important for one, successful change making, and two, for our well being um, as advocates in this work. The second part of our work um, is to help um, all of you increase meaningful and authentic youth engagement. So having a national organization available to provide implementation support consultation um, to help embed youth engagement strategies within each of our service provider agencies within our uh, jurisdictions who are making decisions about funding and um, setting policy. We know and believe deeply that the change um, that is needed is that young people with lived expertise are engaged in making those decisions. Um, throughout our work um, over the last decade, uh, we have advocated for many important changes and youth voices have created um, so many important changes in each of your communities. I'm sure you can think of an example when a young person's story helped um, move the needle to make and offer a better support for their peers. Um, one common change or denominator that has increased year over year is um, our network calling for access to youth peer services. Um, in the beginning, it sort of trickled in. Um, it was almost like a dream. Um, and then we have seen year over year our youth move chapters increase the informal and formal ways they're providing youth peer support while also increasing their calls um, to increase the access to youth peer services within their community. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we can talk a little bit about what do I mean when I say youth peer support. So youth peer support connects youth and young adults with mental health or substance misuse challenges with young adults who have experienced similar challenges and completed specialized training to learn how to use their experience to provide support to other youths. 
Youth peer support um, encompasses a whole range of activities. It can look so different in each of our communities, but the, the action that youth peers are taking is uh, to focus on promoting connection, to share hope, and to support young people in finding their own self-advocacy voice um, to build uh, a pathway to a thriving adulthood. Today, I want to call um, special attention to the distinct and unique features of youth peer support. Um, this type of support is different than all of the other supports that are available to youth and young adults in our mental health service array. Youth peer support is distinctly and intentionally different from the other clinical services that we provide. Youth peer support is built on the mutual, mutuality of shared lived experiences. It's based in empathy that I've been there and therefore I can walk with you through system navigation in a way that others never can who do not understand it in a first person perspective. Um, youth peer support is also uh, distinct from some of the services that we experience or see offer in the adult behavioral health system, um, where peer support is a strong and important part of the services and supports provided. But youth peer support is distinct in the fact that the peer provider is in fact a young person who has experienced lived experience in the child and youth systems. There's a near peer, um, a lack of differential in age that is allows um, this peer service to be unique and distinct. Youth peer support exists in so many ways. Um, we think about youth peer services being offered from an informal to a more formalized uh, continuum. And all of these services are important. Um, why do we think that youth peer support is so important? Why should we be celebrating it um, today? It stems from the fact that young people are asking for this type of support. We know that young people, uh, when they're seeking help, when they're, willing, when they're able to acknowledge that they have a behavioral health challenge and would like to access support um, and have hope for a better future, they turn to their friends and their peers first. Youth peer support uh, maximizes this, providing young people with lived experience available be to be the first messenger um, that a young person might talk to when they reach out for help. We also know that young people who have been previously involved within systems, be it child welfare, juvenile justice, behavioral health, or special education, have not always received the adequate support. They have become weary and often wary of what the system will provide them. Youth peers being the first point of help or outreach can bust that uh, wariness and can offer and outstretch a hopeful hand um, from the beginning. Because we know that young people are so interested in accessing support from peer support, um, we're advocating that we increase the numbers of youth peers uh, and the, uh, the ways and roles that young people serve in peer uh, roles across the system. You can move to the next slide. Uh, youth peer support being centered as a key theme for Children's Mental Health Awareness Day this year um, is so important because all of the ingredients that are necessary um, to help youth peers succeed and flourish uh, are connected to the principles that are embedded in our, in our, our celebration of Mental Health Awareness uh, Day and month. Um, and by that, I mean that in order for youth peer services to be successful, they must be built on the foundation of authentic youth engagement. This means that young people need to have their voices centered in their care, um, to be their own self-advocates, to guide their treatment journeys, and to be seen as the expert of their own lives. Uh, by uplifting and engaging in youth-driven practices within uh, our mental health agencies, within our systems, um, we are going to be able to create a place where youth peer services can flourish. Youth peer services are not about hiring one young person or offering a certain number of drop-in sessions um, each month to young people in your community, but rather they are rooted in a youth voice movement where young people um, bring together their shared, uh, shared stories in order to create change. It is so important for us to build pathways for young people to first become their own self-advocates and then have an opportunity to invest in their leadership development and to develop an identity as a change maker. We don't walk into the roles of youth peer support easily. We don't wake up one day and think, oh, that's the opportunity, that's the career pathway I've always wanted. 
but rather it is a journey through first being offered hope ourselves, um, be able to identify ourselves as advocates and leaders that then walk us into the interest in becoming a part of the mental health service array and providing youth peer support. Without investments in these pathways, uh, we will uh, only dream about uh, youth peer services being available to all young people who want them. Um, and it will be important for you as you invest in youth peer services and hire maybe your first youth peers in your communities and agencies to think about how we network, build a network and a connectivity for those young people to share their experiences um, and learn and grow together. On the next slide, I want to share just a little bit about what I think is um, going to be important as we look forward to the future. So we know today more than 20 states have a youth peer uh, service definition and a Medicaid billing pathway to offer this service in their communities. And many of you are using uh, grant dollars, including SAMHSA grant dollars to invest in building these services. Uh, but this is work that will take more than just one pilot project or uh, one program that you try in your community. In order to meet the true need that young people have today and their appetite for receiving support from their youth peers, we are going to need to do the following things. We need to build pathways for youth to become youth peer providers. And particularly, we need to make sure that these pathways are open and have no barriers for young people with diverse lived experience. Unfortunately, we've learned through our work here at Youth Move National that some young people don't see themselves as potential youth peers because the narrative um, doesn't show their stories. Uh, we're working to change that through our uh, mental health awareness efforts this month around intersectional perspectives um, and hope that you will join us in that. Uh, you, there are many ways you can build pathways for youth peers, including offering advocacy, leadership, and youth peer trainings in your community and also thinking about how to build career pathways for those young people who are already in youth peer roles to have a career ladder in order to grow uh, their responsibilities and their professional career pathway as their skills as a youth peer provider increases. We need to commit to the unique and distinct value that's offered by youth peers. This means we need to prioritize funding, uh, pathways to invest in youth peer support, not as an accessory or an optional service, but as a required service that's available to all young people who seek to access mental health care. We need to put our investment dollars in both informal and formal youth peer supports. Not every young person is going to be uh, desiring, a, <coughs> excuse me, desiring um, an, a young, uh, excuse me, not every young person wants to experience youth peer support in a very formalized mental health agency way. Others may be interested in drop-in centers, in creative art uh, clubs, in poetry stands on Thursday nights. Many of us have funds available that we can use to invest in all of these ways of youth peer support. And finally, we need to invest in the ecosystems around youth peers. The unique role of youth peer means that young people need serving in these roles need to ser serve as a continued advocate for both their own lived expertise and for the role that they hold. This is not sustainable. In order to sustain youth peer services that you are investing in, in your community, you need to be creating spaces for youth peers to connect, uh, to have co-reflection, to have continuing ed opportunities, to be able to be with each other outside of their formal service roles. Additionally, we need to challenge the notion that youth peers can only be hired by mental health provider agencies and rather consider the power of hiring young people into youth run organizations and programs where they can thrive in an environment that truly values their lived expertise and then contract uh, their youth peer services out into the community and into the mental health service areas that you provide. I am excited by the number of folks that are asking us about youth peer support implementation each and every day. Um, we can't wait to connect with you as you make this investment um, and encourage you to think about all of the ways that you um, and your organizations can uh, make these investments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Johanna. Uh, wonderful and lots of great information and really appreciate that. Um, we're going to continue moving forward here um, as our values and principles, in addition to our youth activities, also engaging with families, uh, especially those with lived experience. And I'm really pleased to introduce Hugh Davis, 
the executive director for Wisconsin Family Ties. Uh, Hugh is the father of four children who have mental health needs, and his personal experiences led him to leave his business career behind and join Wisconsin Family Ties, a statewide family-run organization that serves families that uh, include children with social, emotional, behavioral, or mental health type challenges. So uh, Hughes worked diligently to enhance uh, public understanding of children with mental health needs and their families. He's chaired multiple state level mental health committees and has also been involved at the national level. So uh, we're very pleased to have Hugh with us today. And Hugh, I will turn it over to you now. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Blau. And, um, all the rest from SAMHSA, um, it's truly an honor to be here. Uh, I do admit that I'm a bit of an odd choice to be speaking on uh, Children's Mental Health Awareness Day since I wrote a blog post last year that was anti-awareness days. Um, and it's on the slide there. Um, I guess it didn't have very many hits <laughs> and uh, I was asked to come, but since I'm here, we can go to the next slide. Uh, since I'm here, I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about parent peer support. Uh, the three types of uh, peer support in the mental health field share uh, many values. Uh, things like empathy, uh, dignity, choice, uh, no judgment. Um, but beyond those common values, as Johanna mentioned, uh, the practice of peer support is distinct as each of these groups has different needs, uh, they have different systems with which they interact, uh, different resources and different solutions. Um, for example, in uh, a significant area of focus in the adult uh, peer support world is employment. While in the uh, parent peer support arena, it's education and most often special education. Um, I, I do want to mention here, however, though, that these different aspects of peer support should not be seen as adversarial. Uh, I think that there is uh, all of these types of peer support are critical uh, and need to be um, funded at a level that is commensurate with the benefit they provide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, in the rest of this presentation. So uh, next slide, please. So there's no longer any question about the efficacy of parent peer support. Uh, there are abundant research studies showing that peer support produces exceptional outcomes. Uh, these outcomes include things like improved working relationships with providers and systems, uh, increased hope for the future, gains in academic outcomes like attendance, grade point average, uh, graduation, uh, less use of emergency departments, and decreased contact with law enforcement. Uh, next slide. At uh, Wisconsin Family Ties, uh, we made a significant investment uh, in research and evaluation over the past six years. And uh, due to that investment, we now can state without a shadow of a doubt that our parent peer support services increase parenting skills and confidence, uh, prevent child abuse and neglect, improve family and school relationships. And oh, by the way, school issues are the number one issue that families come to us with and keep families together. Uh, in fact, when we uh, first started doing, uh, utilizing a more rigorous process, uh, for evaluation, uh, we found out that 28% of the parents that we talked to believed that their child would no longer be residing at home if it weren't for the services, the parent peer support services that we had provided. We didn't ask that question directly. Uh, the, the question was an open-ended question about what do you think would have uh, been different if you had not had these services? And that is the thing that they offered, 28% of them. Uh, next slide, please. There is uh, no longer any question about which services uh, people prefer either. In a 2016 study conducted by the Medical College of Wisconsin, 
Uh, peer support was identified as the most important service uh, more than twice as often as the second rank service. Uh, there, were, uh, there was an array of 11 services that people could choose from. Uh, respondents indicated that peer support helped them feel less isolated, uh, connected them to resources, and empowered them to find their own solutions. And these outcomes are consistent uh, with the SAMHSA 2016 Awareness Day report, uh, in which parent and caregiver support was rated as more helpful than respite care, case management, or individual and family therapy. Next slide, please. There also is no longer any question about what produces health outcomes. There's been significant research uh, published over the past decade or so uh, that has indicated that social determinants have roughly twice the influence on health outcomes as clinical care. Um, peer support is one of the only services that uh, works across all domains, helping families to get their needs met regardless of what those needs are. Uh, and peer support influence those so social determinants through advocacy, helping develop effective school plans, improving social supports and coping skills, and facilitating, facilitating access to health care. Next slide. Unfortunately, there is a great deal of misunderstanding about peer support, which results in barriers to access. And these are a few on this slide. Um, <clears throat> in our opinion, being at the table is not enough. Uh, the systems in which our kids are involved are complex uh, with arcane rules and sometimes incomprehensible language. Uh, parents need support, coaching, training, to effectively participate in systems change activities. And I believe this is where family-run organizations are crucial, uh, providing a framework for parents to think about the issues and to communicate their suggestions effectively. Secondly, um, at its core, peer support is an iterative problem-solving service, I believe. Uh, when we're working with a family, uh, we may have 10 or more brief interactions during uh, the course of a day to deal with a particular situation. Um, however, th that doesn't fit well into the current funding models, which are generally built on service authorization uh, kinds of models. Uh, X number of hours per uh, client per month or per week whatever, uh, and it presumes services occur on a regular and periodic basis uh, for a block of time. And again, that's just not compatible with the way that peer support works. Uh, one of the great advantages of peer support is its immediacy, and we must have funding models that accommodate this. Next is uh, the area of certification, and while I'm, I'm uh, very supportive of the president's um, mental health initiative. Um, I, I think that we need to all remember that uh, in the area of parent peer support, uh, family run organizations, not certification programs, are the guardians of uh, high fidelity parent peer support. Um, in fact, there is some evidence, and I'm not going to get into the details of this. If anybody wants to know any more about that, they can contact me later. But there is some evidence that certification is actually diminishing the effectiveness of peer support. And so finally, I think we also need to confront the challenge of embedding peer support in traditional clinical agencies. Johanna touched on this in her presentation as well, and uh, talking about the need to have uh, youth run organizations. I firmly believe in peer and family run organizations. And again, I think those organizations are the ones who, um, who uh, uh, it not only establish, but continue to hold to the standard of high fidelity peer support. And so too often, some of these um, deep misunderstandings about what, par what parent peer support really is leads to ineffective supervision or marginal, marginalization of the role. Um, 
and I say this not to disparage any um, you know, more clinical agency, uh, it's just a, a, a fact that there are still some uh, very strong misunderstandings about what peer support is. And we typically will see supervision being conducted by someone who has a clinical background rather than a peer support background. Um, there's also a uh, sense that there may be, um, that peer support is anti-treatment. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, when we conducted that uh, study in 2016 with the Medical College of Wisconsin, that was one of the things that we wanted to find out was how often uh, peer support workers were referring uh, the people that they worked with to um, other mental health services. And we found that in more than 70% of the cases, they were referring them to mental health services. The more interesting part of the study, however, showed that the engagement of people in those services that were referred by the peer support worker was 96%, which is higher than anything that we could find in literature in terms of engagement rates. So peer support is highly effective in helping people engage into needed mental health services. Uh, next slide, please. What should we then do? So on this Children's Mental Health Action Day, we call it Action Day instead of awareness, I call on uh, our states to align their children's mental health systems and funding models with research on the social determinants of health instead of the medical model, which has failed to produce promised outcomes. Uh, those systems should not require entry into the child welfare or youth justice systems to access needed mental health services. I also call on the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to re-examine their guidance on peer support issued 15 years ago through a Dear Colleague letter. Specifically, I'm, I would urge them to consider the vital role of peer and youth and family-run organizations and to reconsider their guidance on supervision and instead consider clinical consultation. And finally, I call on Congress to fund SAMHSA Statewide Family Network Grant Program for every state and territory. Um, at a time when the news is filled with legislative proposals in the billions and even trillions, and the country's billionaires launch private space programs, is $28.5 million really too much to ask for kids that we too often lose? So I ask you to join me in this call to action and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Hugh. And uh, I put in chat that I love National Children's Mental Health Action Day. And, and I love that you are um, continuing to push the envelope on these important topics. And your perspective, that of Johannes and, and, and everyone has been tremendously helpful. Um, we're gonna shift now um, and thank Johanna and Hugh uh, for their expertise. And our final presentation for today's session will be uh, done uh, by Dr. Melinda Baldwin. She is the Director of the Division of Prevention, Traumatic Stress and Special Programs. Uh, that is the division now that houses uh, all or almost all of the Center for Mental Health Services discretionary programs for uh, children, youth and families. Dr. Baldwin is a subject matter expert in behavioral health and trauma in program evaluation. She's had an extensive field experience and background being on the front lines as a social worker in the, in the child welfare system. And now uh, through SAMHSA uh, addressing all of the issues and programs related to youth mental health. And one of my partners in this activity, let me uh, warmly introduce and thank her for joining us, Dr. Melinda Baldwin. Thank you so much, Dr. Blau. And we've had some technical difficulties, so I hope I'm with you um, and, uh, and that all the technology is working. So thank you. And as uh, Gary said, I'm Melinda Baldwin, uh, the director of the Division of Prevention, Traumatic Stress and Special Programs, but we affectionately refer to our division as the Children's Division. And I also wanna thank Johanna and Hugh for being with us today. We are honored to have them celebrate this Children Mental Health Awareness or Action Day with us. 
their work and all of the work of, of all of you here on the, the line today with us is essential and integral in our work here at SAMHSA. We are in unprecedented times with an unprecedented opportunity available to us to think about mental health care for our children, our youth, our young adults in ways that we may not have done so before. For over the last two years, children and their families have been impacted by the pandemic in various ways in our communities and schools and work settings. And over the course of the last two years, we've witnessed soaring rates of mental health challenges among children, adolescents and their families, exacerbating what we know was the pre-existing epidemic, particularly for children, youth and families. We know that depression and anxiety doubled in youth compared to pre-pandemic levels. We know that over 200,000 children in our country have experienced the death of a primary or secondary caregiver due to COVID-19, with children of color uh, having been disproportionately impacted. The Surgeon General has issued an advisory on children's mental health connected to all of the concerns we just mentioned the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the Children's Hospital Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics have all communicated similar sentiments that our children need our support. Um, and so as we pull the threads from what we heard this afternoon, I want to leave you with questions, questions to ponder, to discuss with your teams, in your communities, and most importantly, in these spaces with our children, our youth, our young adults, and their families. How do we conceive of a mental health system that is responsive to the needs of our youth, our young adults, their families, to provide the level and quality of support that they need to live healthy and productive lives? We know that children and adolescents are different, or developmentally, excuse me, different than adults, that they live in the context of families and caregivers and are connected to many different systems in ways adults aren't. Systems such as education, child welfare, juvenile justice, and much needed pediatric care. Here at SAMHSA, we believe in a system that is specifically designed to meet the needs of young people and their families, a system that promotes a connection to necessary supports and services. But how do we operationalize this? And I think Johanna and Hugh pointed out, you know, very important ways to think about that. And Dr. Delphin Rittman talked about the framework that we're uh, talking about here at SAMHSA. But we really need to challenge ourselves to think about children's services through a developmental lens, through a family lens, a community lens, an equity lens. How do we do that? As Dr. Everett said, we've redesigned how we think about ch children's services at SAMHSA. We have moved branches around so that all of the children's services are in one division and we're building a division culture. But prior to this, and we are so striving to get better, but so as so many of you know, change is really hard, especially in a system like the federal government. So that programs that had been overseen by one or two government project officers, or maybe within one branch with asylum program focus are now being able to embrace a, a larger perspective. And so when we start that more collaborative work, we've actually you know, learned of communities that had multiple SAMHSA children's grants and one didn't know about the other. So we started by just connecting folks at the community level with one another. Um, but then we've also begun work with our colleagues at the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment and building those bridges across SAMHSA of work that we do in collaboration in, at the community level, but we have become siloed at the federal government level. We've also begun work with our partners at other federal agencies, such as the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we found the same thing, that we were often working in the same communities, but weren't connected at that level. Um, we've just begun conversations with our partners at the Housing and Urban Development Agency at HUD 
to be able to connect our grantees there to be able to increase mental health literacy in a HUD's uh, housing program. So we're so excited about that work. But the way I conceptualize it, and I, and I also use the word silos initially, and maybe it's because my family came from a farming community in central Illinois, but silos are rigid structures that, that connect only kind of at the top and, and they can be dangerous places to hang out with as well. And so the way we're thinking about it in, the, in our division is play. And so how do we think about, you know, and, and you'll be able to tell I used to do a lot of play therapy. How do we move from solitary play to parallel play to associative play in the same sandbox? And of course, our goal being that collaborative play. And so we've begun doing that through several key initiatives that I'd like to tell you just a little bit about. Um, our Children's Crisis Continuum of Services, which Dr. Delphin Rittman uh, briefly touched on at the beginning of our program today, we're in the process of developing a document to lay out uh, what SAMHSA believes are priorities in terms of working with children, youth, and young adults in the crisis space. And we've had help from a, a lot of you on this call um, to do that, to help think through what is key to putting in a document such as this one. In our school-based mental health program, our AWARE program, we're looking at school safety through a public health lens. And as many of you saw, we're moving um, that AWARE program to embrace the framework that Dr. Delphin Rittman talked about in terms of how we conceptualize school mental health services. And lastly, our interagency task force for trauma-informed care. We are taking an opportunity to build a culture of cooperative play across 22 agencies in the federal government, placing a clear focus on the very important issue of childhood trauma. Thinking about childhood trauma being a serious public health issue in the United States and thinking about how can we build a theory of change and infrastructure within the federal government to be able to respond to that, to build resilience, to build uh, systems within communities to respond and to help children and their families. Um, exciting thing is in this last budget, we just received $1 million to put our operating plan into action. And so we're so excited to begin to build that initiative out. So I highlight these initiatives for you with an awareness that collaboration in spaces where our children are the focus is not easy and that we all come to this work through our own lens. And so I encourage us and challenge all of us today to think about what can we do in a different light? How can we move beyond that solitary parallel play to cooperative play? And how can we build that work with one another? Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Blau. Thank you so much, Melinda. Wonderful. And thank you to you and your entire team. Your staff has been remarkable in moving the needle on so many of these issues. Uh, um, and I think that just to wrap up in, in closing, I want to thank uh, all of our presenters for our assistant secretary for being here, our center director, uh, obviously, Johanna and Hugh and Melinda. It's been a, a really jam-packed hour. Uh, hopefully, folks will follow up with us. I hope you heard the, the definitive message that SAMHSA is interested in providing hope hope across America. We have leadership now that's prepared to prioritize a focus on children, youth, young adults, and their families. And that together with you, with our youth and families, our federal colleagues, legislators, public and private health systems, community organizations, community providers, faith-based organizations, businesses, foundations, anyone interested in the child serving arena and anyone who cares about our nation's youth, we wanna to work together with you so that we can address the priorities and themes highlighted in SAMHSA's HOPE framework and ultimately work together to improve the mental, emotional and behavioral health and wellness of children, youth and families across the country. Thank you for joining us on today. We're happy to be back in this, in this space and we wish all of you the very best as you continue your tremendous efforts to improve the lives of young people all over the country. Be well. <laughs>